cool. All right, the person talks to, announces the recording is a little quieter today. Um, all right, so what uh, we're gonna go over a little bit, again, this is kind of like a little bit me kind of twisting around how the curriculum's done. Uh, we're gonna go back into statistical testing and I'm gonna show you a Welsh's test and then probably a NOVA test too, which in a NOVA test, really in a lot of ways, it's just multiple comparisons. Um, and we'll talk about that. And I think we'll actually talk a little bit in the, um, what's it called? Some of the questions we had from, actually, I think it was last time um, that we'll kind of go over and they'll actually address some of the questions that we're gonna talk about. So I'm gonna share my screen and you guys can see that that way. Let's see here. Um, is that right? Yes, okay. So, sorry, I'm moving my windows around. Okay. So, okay, this is from last, I know this was written from last time, but I didn't address it. So, resampling, can you explain the t-test revisited after the permutation test? Is the p-value supposed to be matched up from the permutation test? So, I thought I pulled this up, maybe, oh, this is, this is it right here. So, I'm actually going to pull up the GitHub because it's a little bit easier for me to navigate. And I'm actually going to go to solutions. So, never feel afraid to look at the solutions, right? Um, but they're looking at specifically, I think, I don't know if the person who asked this question um, was here, is here, or like wants to go in detail. But I think they were talking about this specific part of um, this section, this lesson. And going off of their question, what did they say? Um, is the p-value supposed to match up with the result of the permuta permutation test? So in, um, if you guys, give me a thumbs up if you guys know what the difference between a permutation test versus like just doing the t-test. Give me a sideways, you're like, oh, I don't know. Give me a thumbs up, like, I didn't get to this section yet. Okay, cool, that's good. You guys are all right here. That's, that means there's out, uh, um, opportunity for you guys to learn. So um, permutation test is basically doing a t-test manually. So remember how we could like, actually, like I'm gonna draw a little bit on the screen. You guys can all see this print, yeah. Um, permutation test part. And so if you imagine like, this is the t-test right here, right? Our t-distribution, it's not a great distribution because I'm no good at writing. Um, and we basically say, okay, like this is our critical value right here, right? So let's say it's one tail. We want to get over here, right? And we say, okay, like we want to get at this point right here, okay? We can actually calculate all these numbers numerically because we can actually write the formula, right, for this actual t distribution or normal distribution or whatever distribution we have. The idea here is that we actually have an idealized formula that we can write this out. And then we basically can figure out, like, okay, like from this x point right here, Okay. We can actually figure out the area under the curve using calculus, essentially. Like that's how we actually are able to figure this part out. And if that value is smaller, right, this area underneath the curve is smaller than what the area would be for actual p value right here. Okay. Then it's like, oh, cool, we we reject the null hypothesis, which means the alternative is more likely. Okay. So the thing is about this is that we can actually do this manually. And so remember this alpha level right here in our p value here, right? What was our alpha? Like, can someone like just kind of, like in their own words, what did alpha mean besides just saying it's a significance level? Testing whether your data is significantly um, different than zero. Yeah, so it does deal with something with significance in the sense that like, is it significantly different, right? Um, why do we have to set this alpha to a certain value? Like if I said alpha is equal to 0 0.05, some, can someone interpret that? Like, what does that mean? What, like, what does it mean by the 0 0.05? Yeah, go ahead. It Just. means there's like a 5% chance that due to randomness that is from our like population or right. sample. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so five percent. I think you got those pieces in there. Uh, I think okay. I know what you're saying. <laughs> so there's a five percent chance that if we did this experiment from this population, that we would actually fail to reject the null hypothesis. Even I'm sorry, uh, type one error. So we actually reject the null hypothesis, even though it's not um, it's not significant, right? So that's kind of the idea here is like, okay, like, but usually we don't know this part. And when we get this p value here, right, which is really the p value is like this value right here, but it's really calculating this curve underneath here. We're saying what percent chance using our sample of us actually like um, getting in this value. And if there's only like a 3% chance for us to be getting into this part, but it really not significant, right? That's essentially what we're doing. We're essentially doing this alpha 
but we're doing it with our just um, sample distribution. And that determines our p-value. So what we can do is essentially say, well, we have a sample. And we say, OK, let's sample over the sample. Like, let's resample, right? Basically, take a random sample over the sample, bootstrap. And we can take a sample over there and say, OK, like, how many times do we get really extreme values? And if those extreme values happen very infrequently compared to our significance level, we can say, hey, like based on our sample, it seems unlikely for us to actually get these values. So we actually reject the null hypothesis and say the alternative hypothesis more likely. And that's where permutate, that's what really what permutation is doing. Is that man, my mouse is just doing weird stuff today. Sorry. Um, my permutation, like that's what this permutation test is doing. It's saying, well, instead of us doing the actual formula, doing this t-distribution, all this stuff, we just say, well, let's just take the sample and just sample over it, right? Saying how many different combinations can we do, right? From bootstrap, essentially. Um, or there's other methods too, but bootstrap is one of them. And just say, how many times would we actually fall out of this range? And that gives us our p-value. So the question, go back to the original question was I know there's stuff on the screen right now so was, um, so that's kind of like taking a coin and flipping it a whole bunch of times each time yeah. you can consider a sample right and if you keep mm -hmm. getting tails as opposed to you know heads tails heads tails eventually if if it keeps going then you say there's something wrong here then you reject it's, your no it's a, actually a little more subtle than that so it's more like you already did the t like you flipped your coin mm -hmm. like 10 times and so you have 10 examples and then you randomly pick from those 10 examples, like essentially you just pick a ran, like pick it randomly and say, oh, when I flipped it, it was a tails, you know, and then you write that down and then create that as your sample. And you would do that multiple times. So you would create like, let's say you flipped the coin originally 10 times, right? And so you have like six heads and four tails. You would then randomly sample across those events to create a new sample. So most of the time, you'll probably get something around like six heads, four tails. Sometimes you'll get five and five. Sometimes you'll get really extreme, like, you know, eight heads or nine heads and one tail, right? Um, but you're sampling across that original sample. That's why we call it a resample. Um, so it's actually a little more subtle. It's like you're not actually redoing the experiment. You, in a sense, are using the experiment results to kind of like theoretically do the experiment again, assuming those, re essentially you're assuming those results are true right? Like, like, oh, these are representative of the true population, in this case of coin flip being fair. Um, and you're resampling across it to create a new thing. So the idea is like, if this new sample, like these resamples closely follow saying, well, okay, they don't seem, when we resample over that sample, like it's, it's confusing, right? But like when we re do those resamples, if those resamples do not end up being too weird from what we would expect, we can say, oh, our sample probably was, you know, um, representative of the population. Or we say, oh, like, this is actually weirder than we would normally expect, you know, or what we originally um, would expect, which is your significance value. And you say, okay, that means our sample must have been the weirdos. Like, like we, this is not part of the population that we expected. This is not part of the null hypothesis uh, distribution, essentially. So that's kind of, it's a little bit subtle than just like doing the experiment again. It's kind of like taking your experiment results and then pretending you did the experiment using your experiment results, which sounds very weird, but it's because we don't actually have the true population. Um, that's what a permutation test is doing. So does that make sense? Cool. All right. I saw some head bounce and stuff. Um, but uh, basically, um, going back to the question, right? Uh, it's like, okay, hey, is the p-value supposed to match up with the results of the permutation test? Answer is, well, let me ask you guys. Would you expect the p-value to like that we calculate from the curve to be the same value as our permutation tests? Oh yeah, I hope so. Right. You'd hope, right? But will it be exact? No, probably not. And why? When? Why wouldn't it probably be um, ex like? Why would it be different? Is it, it's a different simulation. Yeah, it's randomly picked, right? There's some randomness built into it. So even your resample, it's not going to be perfect. However, if you do many, many times over random. Um, random numbers, this is the law of large numbers. Like that's literally what it's called, the, lar yeah. the law of large numbers. You approach like what you would expect. Um, it's also called like a frequentist. A frequentist expects that as you uh, do many, many times, you would actually get the real, like quote unquote, the real world result. Um, note that's gonna be slightly different when we talk about Bayesian statistics. Um, but that's kind of like the idea of permutation test. And that's why you probably won't get the same exact e value. However, you should hopefully get something relatively close. Like if it's way off from each other and you did many, many resamples, 
you might want to check your code and make sure you know things go through or if you did the right you know um you did your p-value calculation correctly um uh, Victor, question yeah um is there a difference between like the, this permutation test or like uh the uh like the inbuilt like normal distribution functions that just, like runs a bunch of different samples creates a bunch of different samples you're saying um can can you go hmm. i'm not sure exactly like they're the, like they're they're inbuilt functions that like can generate a bunch of like a bunch of samples and you can like like mess with those statistics and stuff mm -hmm. like is that is is that the same is that does that work any differently than this permutation testing because this also creates a bunch of different samples right yeah i guess i should say the permutation test is much more like a way like you're using sampling to get an answer if that makes sense are you saying more like when you calculate the p value yeah. Is it actually doing this permutation test in the background or yeah, something? Yeah, that's what I'm, yeah, that's what I'm asking, yeah. Yeah, so in general, um, most of the things are done actually through specific calculation. And the reason why is that then you can basically have deterministic values, right? You know for sure. You don't have to worry about randomness, right? Because then there's the whole argument, like, well, what is random? Is this random enough? You know, how many times do we have to do for lar large numbers? Like, it could be many, many times before we feel comfortable that we actually reach a real random sample and everything like that. So in general, is that if we have a formula for this, most statistical packages will straight up just use a formula essentially right. to try to calculate this. And you could technically do this yourself too, but then you'd have to do all the calculus yourself. And mm. I don't know, like we're data scientists. We, we don't got time yeah. for a bunch of calculus. Yeah. Work, time so. to, to integrate finding it. We won't yeah. it. <laughs> exactly. Cool. Um, yeah, any other questions on this? This, uh, this is a kind of a subtle part. Um, I think sometimes depending on how you learn this stuff, you might actually hear permutation testing first and then say, this is now we have a really nice, easy way to do this. You punch in the calculator, punch in your computer, and it spits out the answer. Um, permutation test is a way to do this without actually doing that formula. Um, I think I see Andy moving his hand over there. Yeah. Uh, so I was the one to ask this question. Mm -hmm. If you scroll down uh, to the T test we visited, they, uh, mm -hmm. they showed that the uh, p-value calculated through permutation test is 0.989. Then the okay. t the p value calculated in the t test was 0 0.619. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if do we need to add more sampling to get a closer p value, or is the code uh, yeah wrong? So I think in this case I'm looking at 10,000 times, depending on how big essentially like how big the spread was. Mm -hmm. is that we might actually have to do more than 10,000 times. Like, this is where like, the weird numbers is like, it's people say like, oh, you do between, like, I, I know, like, for a fact, usually, Sita so has say 10,000 times. This could be like literally 10, like, the, the numbers are usually a large number of times, which is like, they literally say 10,000 to 100,000, which when you think about that's like 10 times as many. Um, I think that might be possibly what's going on here. I honestly haven't run this code myself in a while, but that's my suspicion from based on what I'm seeing here. Yeah, so my guess is that you probably need to run this more. Oh, wait. Um, sorry, I'm thinking things through. So this is what happens when I have to like read it on the fly. I'm like, wait, is it? Um, because the part that gets me is that I almost wonder, no, I think this is right. One thing I was thinking is like, if you're getting the T critical value instead of the P value itself, that could be the difference. Cause that is a pretty big difference even with 10,000. Um, just as kind of random times, diff mu. Hmm. It could like, it could, uh, I'll be honest, it could be part, could be the code. Um, if something like this looks fine here, Mm -hmm. Like you're just counting the number of times this fails. Yeah. It could be bootstrap, like this function that was created, but I don't, my guess is that it wouldn't be just based on. I mean, bootstrap and permutation test give about the same p value. Mm -hmm. But it's just the actual testing, mm -hmm. the t test gives it's a different. Yeah. Yeah. This, this makes me think is that I think this might be written. Oh. I think this might be supposed to be, oh, this is, I think it's supposed to be n minus one, to be honest, but 
Why would they change? Sorry. Oh, okay, they're calculating the T value. They're reading in the T value in here for N minus one degrees of freedom. I'd have to look at this a little bit closer just to make sure. Um, when you guys run this, is that like the numbers do come out as 0 0.619, right? Yeah. Okay. Sometimes if they save it, but like they didn't change the code afterwards, sometimes this thing can change. But I suspect, now I'm wondering, it's either this part right here, but actually now I'm looking at this closer, this might actually be fine. I'm wondering if maybe this should be n minus one, this variance in here is. Hmm. Okay, I, I won't spend too much time on this. Maybe I'll look into this a little bit closer too, to check this out, to see if someone's come across this. But you, yeah, so Andy, you were saying like this is right here, this worked out fine. And then you had another test that you did? Uh, if you scroll back up the P, the permutation test right there, mm -hmm. also gave the similar P value. Okay. But it's just the T test revisited part that uh, confused me. Yeah, I wouldn't. I'm trying to think if there's a reason why this would have happened. Um, it probably is because the n minus one, because like sample variance uh, gets is a, a very high probability of getting skewed. Yeah, and this a and b, it depends too. Like the t test might actually not be the most appropriate one to do here, as well. Like Welsh's test might actually be a better choice, and maybe you'd get okay. a closer value, but it shouldn't be too different. Well, I mean, there's not that many points in here, so that's possible. Um, I'd have to look at it closer just to be sure, but yeah, I think this, this code right here, this should be fine. Like at most that you could change probably is this guy, like maybe put a few bit more, but it wouldn't make it that huge of a difference for this part. Mm, okay. Okay, cool. Good point though. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I was, I'm going to take a note to myself to make sure I get back to that later because I'm kind of curious now. All right, cool. Wow, we are, all right, we're going right through, but that's good. These are good questions and stuff. Hopefully you guys are finding this useful. Um, okay, so any other questions about that material or things that you guys noticed for that lesson? Cool, okay. All right, so this is where um, someone mentioned about ANOVA. And so just give me a thumbs up. Um, who's gotten to the part where you actually talk about ANOVA? Thumbs up, okay. Some thumbs up, some people go, nah, not really. Okay, that's okay. So I'm gonna kind of jump ahead into this part just because I think this is kind of confusing. And when you guys get to it, you'll probably be like, what's going on here? So I'm actually gonna to go to the lesson. Oops. And then the question says, uh, please explain how this table's formed, right? Specifically this, this great thing, um, which I just love relearning. Re <laughs> I remember back in the day I learned LLS um, first before I was like SciPy and I was like, oh my gosh, like what is going on? So for the record, uh, OLS, which is what is being used on here, with stats models is supposed to be representative. Um, I think, Jessica, you said you've done R before, right? Um, has anyone else used R before? I think maybe Casey Alvaro, I see Akiva, okay. So R is another programming language, like different from Python. Um, this is supposed to most closely represent R. And then you say, why? <laughs> like, why are we representing R in this Python code? And the reason why is because all the statisticians use R and essentially is that OLS stats models is the best representation of R statistical packages. And R actually has a really great, like, uh, like, like it's much more mature in using um, statistics and stuff. So that's kind of like why you see this funkiness, which is very different from if you look at SciPy with how it does it things. Um, so know that this is where this form is coming from. But let's go to the actual lesson, which I think is this one right here. Yeah, okay. So main thing about, ANOVA, since we have, maybe some of you guys haven't talked about it. Basically, ANOVA is essentially statistical tests, but for multiple uh, categories at once. So for example, if you had um, different flavors of jelly beans and you wanted like different, sorry, different colors of jelly beans and you want to see if there's significant difference in the weight of the jelly bean or the amount of sugar content in the jelly bean or something like that based on color, you, the right thing to do is actually use something like an ANOVA test where you do multiple comparisons. Um, the thing about ANOVA tests is that it's not supposed to tell you, um, it's not supposed to tell you which thing is, if it sounds statistically significant, it doesn't tell you which category, like if it's the purple jelly bean, the green jelly bean, the whatever jelly bean, right? It doesn't tell you which one is significant, it just tells you there is a significant difference, but you don't know which one it is. Um, at that point, you would probably do multiple t, uh, t tests comparing the ones that you 
care about or like looking for it. Um, this was really important back when basically you had to do all this by hand without computers and stuff. Nowadays, to be quite honest, um, a lot of people in the industry will actually just write a t-test, like write code to basically make multiple t-tests and does a pretty good job. But ANOVA basically can give you very quickly say, hey, does this category actually matter? Which we'll see later on in linear regression because turns out ANOVA is actually very similar. It's actually, an, it's using linear regression with the general linearized model. But anyway, I'm gonna go into that. So this formula right here, you can think of this being like um, the value Right, so like, think of this like an equation like y, let me write that on here. You can think of this equation is kind of like saying y equals some number times x1. So this is like the y part right here. And that's kind of hard to see. So like this control fire. And the squiggle right here, this tilde, is the equal sign. It's equal to basically some variable x, x sub 1 plus some other factor column, x2. And note that tech, I'm not, I might put the coefficients, but technically there should be coefficients in front of it, but x1 plus x2, and then plus x3, and then plus however many categories you have essentially. And you can see that they just end it with x, which is like xn, okay? And so that's what this formula they're writing right here. And so when you do an ANOVA test, basically you're saying, hey, here's my different categories. And I think in this case, you can actually see that there's only three categories. It looks like just X, E, and M. So one thing with um, OLS, uh, which is from stats model, so just know the import right here, right? Is that what you're saying is like, okay, um, S is basically the individual salary, X is years of experience, E is education level, and M is management. Um, what we're trying to say is like, hey, does, does years of experience actually matter? Does education actually matter in determining salary? Does management level or management actually matter for salary? And so what you're saying is like, well, okay, there's some combination of essentially um, years of experience plus education plus management together, you know, there hopefully is some connection with this Y value, which is S, the salary itself. So the way we do this is say, okay, if we say what S, which is the thing that we care about, is dependent on, that's where this little tilde, where you can think of it like equals, right? And then saying, you know, oh, is it dependent on education and management and experience all put together? Okay, the reason why this weird C, is everyone following me on that so far? Okay, see, not it's cool. The weird C thing right here, you're like, okay, what's a C and then of E and then a C of M? The C basically saying like, hey, well, technically these aren't just numbers, even though they're numbers on here. E is saying educational level, so there's a category. So that C is representing saying, hey, treat this as a category, and that's gonna be very different with how you actually, um, what's it called? How you actually do an ANOVA test, essentially. Um, we kind of mentioned this before with like movie titles and genres and stuff. We talked about like one hot encoding, if you guys remember back with the project. That's kind of what's going on here is that the category is gonna create a one hot encoding so it can actually do this test properly. Um, but main thing is that if it's cate categorical, you should call it with C and oh, that's like, oh, okay, I understand that basically salary, you're seeing is salary dependent on the education, which is a category, management, which is a category, and X, which is just an actual value, in this case, years of experience. Um, and then saying, okay, this is our formula. This is very like not offshore in programming, if you guys know that term. Um, that's where OLS is kind of copying a little bit of like how R does stuff. And you feed in this formula, which is just a string, into our actual data, our DF for data, right? And we do a dot fit. And dot fit basically saying, hey, like try to take this model, which is what this is right here, what we think how these things all depend on each other, and try to fit it and see, like if you could fit, if you could kind of adjust all the numbers between the two, like the coefficients of like, you know, how much does education actually matter? How much does years of experience actually matter? Adjust those until it fits as close as we can, uh, which we'll talk about with linear regression, like what that means. Um, but basically like, okay, like fit this as best you can with the actual data. And then this table at, uh, with this guy right here, so we were doing an ANOVA table with the LM, which is the linear model. If you're wondering what LM stands for, linear model. And we say, hey, show me the results of this linear model of like basically trying to combine this together. And what they have here is like this table. Okay, everyone follow me so far from like, at least from this step to here, to here, cool, I see nods. 
All right, awesome. Stop me if like there's something that you're like, wait, I don't understand. So this table right here is basically representing a few, they're saying a whole bunch of different things. So one is basically saying, um, let's see here, I don't remember this right now. I don't usually use LLS for the record, but DF should represent degrees of freedom. Um, basically saying how many degrees of freedom you have. So it looks like there's 41 data points probably. I don't know if anyone's looked at this already um, and played around with it. I think there's a total of 41 data points. Does that seem right? Maybe, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, this right here, some, some square. Basically, we're gonna learn something that basically this part right here is just saying, oh, show me how much error it is from your best linear model, which is this guy right here with all the numbers adjusted like how far off are each of these things from that linear model? Essentially, what is this error on here? And this F part right here, you're like, oh, what's this weird F thing? That's because, real big secret, is that ANOVA is actually an F test. And so we can actually use F tests to basically, hey, like these are essentially like, remember like T critical values, right? This is essentially an F critical value. That's what these things are represented. But then of course, like, do you guys know what an F test is? Like, no, right? Like, do you like, and even people who don't have an F test, they don't know the exact numbers, just like the T critical value. Like, I don't know what the T critical value is, just like this weird number I have to look up and they convert to a P value. So they report the P value right here, which is what this is. So the probability of greater than F. So that's really what's going on here is our P value. And so you can see here is that if we have very small numbers, which you can see here, um, you guys all know scientific notation, right? Cool. Um, if you don't know, right? E, right? E basically means saying this is 7.67 times. 10 to the power of negative 11. So we move the decimal place like 11 times, right? So super, super small probability, right? So that basically means like, hey, like it is pretty like, at least based on this data and on this test, um, it's likely that this right here actually has a direct effect on salary, right? And that's what we're seeing for each one of these things. Again, um, based on this, can you actually say which one has the most effect? I'll give you a hint first. Like you'll probably be drawn towards this p-value, right? Can you say which one has the most effect? All right, good. Silence is the correct answer because you can't tell, right? So you remember p-value only tells you if it's significant or not. It doesn't tell you to what degree this actually matters. Okay. Yeah, trick question. Good. <laughs> I saw someone unmute themselves, but I saved them before. I <laughs> said same thing. All right. Um, all right, cool. So any questions on this guy right here in the yeah, like paragraph below it says management is the most influential so that really threw me yeah that's wrong um <laughs> i I'll, I'll say it right now is that you can't say that because how do i say this how do you like how do you express that if i say management matters the most like what exactly does that mean in some ways like it's just management or not and in a lot of ways the p-value itself doesn't actually express that. And this is where technically, like, people will say this, and usually people understand, like, oh, they're not literally saying it is the most, man like, the most effective and stuff like this. But this p-value really is just saying it's the significance of, like, if it's um, effective or not. And like we saw with, like, um, with, like, effect size, you really need to say effect size, right? And this effect size is actually encompassed into the coefficients of this linear model. So you can actually pull up later, we'll do this with linear regression, you can pull up the coefficients and that in some ways represents really how much effect does this have. So like, for example, if your data, if you have a bunch of managers in it, right? Like, um, let's, let's just say you have managers versus not managers, right? And then you have like um, X, which is years of experience, but your X is only of like one or two years, you'll probably find is that there's not much actual effect, but what you might find, or let's say the extreme part, we have one years or 10 years, right? You might have a significant value or even one and two, you might have a significant value, but it doesn't tell you how much of an effect that actually is. You really have to look at the coefficient and effect size. So yeah, hopefully that kind of clears it up. I know maybe, maybe this is something I need to go to a curriculum team and kind of talk about. <laughs> Because I don't, yeah, I, I don't agree with that. If it says- yeah, And the, the lab just after that as well, you asked him to put a table and it tells you like, oh, so this thing is, well, this factor is more important than the others. And I was like, mm. Mm, Yeah, this is where like, <sighs> yeah, no. <laughs> 
Um, there, there's other ways to pull this information out. And I will, maybe I'm in a difference. Maybe, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'll talk to the team who wrote this. I don't actually know who specifically wrote this. Um, maybe they have ways that they're interpreting this that might honestly might be legitimate, but I wouldn't necessarily agree with. I would say the legitimate thing to do is like, you shouldn't look at the p-value as saying, oh, it's the most effective thing. Because as we saw, effect size matters, right? Like, we don't care if it's like, oh, like, let's say it does have, it's very significant, but like the actual difference in value is not very much. That's not going to be told from this directly. Yeah. It's usually, like, I'll say this, it's like, it usually is p like a lower p-value usually means that there's a bigger effect, but not necessarily. And that's why you have to be, in, in my opinion, you have to be more careful, so. Okay. Cool. All right. Good. These are these are really good questions, by the way. Um, anything? Any follow up on this guy? Like, it's funny. There's just a little bit of code, but there's a whole lot going on. That's pretty good. Cool. All right. Um, so I just want to make sure you guys are cool if I just keep going through these last questions and stuff like that. I see some nods and stuff. Okay. And if there's more things that come up you guys want me to go over, we can do that too. All right. So Nova, uh, please explain how to interpret the table. Oh, you talked about this. How can you tell which factor has the higher impact, which is the highest F, right? So again, technically, um, you really shouldn't be using the F, like it, the F or the problem, like the p-value to really say if it, it has more significant, like has, I shouldn't say it's more significant. It doesn't mean it has a bigger effect because those again are completely separate from each other. In practice, usually a bigger, or sorry, a smaller p-value usually means there's a bigger effect, but not necessarily, and that's where you have to be careful. Okay, um, and then this last one here, KS test, which I can never pronounce its name. Um, I'm glad you put KS, but uh, why why the terminology was changed from fail to reject to accept when we can't accept? Uh, yeah, I know. Um, this is my personal gripe you should never accept an, uh, a null hypothesis or accept any hypothesis. Because um, I, I don't know if I repeat this last time, so kind of give me a thumbs up as I'm talking about this, if I did already said this, but like in science, you cannot technically prove gravity. Have I said this already to people? Okay, good, yeah. So yeah, same, same thing. You can't, you can't accept gravity. You can only try to disprove, you try to come up with other situ situations, other systems, disprove those, and if you disprove everything else, it's likely that your theory of gravity is correct, right? Or whatever scientific theory, and that's the same thing. So technically, can you, will you see people say accept? Um, I gotta figure out who wrote this now. Um, <laughs> so uh, Jessica, yeah. There was, um, uh, in one of the lessons, I don't remember which lesson it was, um, when it was talking about p-values and alpha values, on the lesson plan it says, um, with alpha equal to 0 0.05, basically we're saying we're okay with accepting HA as true um, if blah, blah, blah. So it says that in the notes. <laughs> yeah, all right. Are you, are you talking about like the, from, the, from, the, from the curriculum, right? From the like, curriculum is what I mean. Yeah, yeah, it yeah I wouldn't, that I wouldn't write that stuff there. Um, no. <laughs> um, yeah, this is where, again, I'm sure there are people who will literally tell me it's like, it's not that, like, it's it's perfectly fine to use this. I will say, just for the sake of, like, statistics and mathematics, and I will say is that if you're talking to someone, like, let's say the person who's going to hire you, um, like, in an interview, um, it doesn't hurt to be more, a little bit more pedantic, because if you say some things like, oh, it's more colloquial, people understand what you're saying, the assumption can be, like, especially in certain fields, like, I think sometimes, and data science are pretty, like, comfortable in the sense that because there's so many people from different fields, but there are people you'll come across who are a little more like, oh, that's not the correct way. You must not know anything. Um, and honestly, I try to tell you guys, avoid that because it's just one less thing you don't have to do. Um, but technically, it should be failed to reject, not accept. Um, I don't know. I'm like, man, there's so many lessons I'm going to have to go through now and like talk to the curriculum team a little bit. <laughs> this is all being recorded too, but that's okay. They're not going to watch these videos, so they're not going to mind. All right. Um, cool. So yeah, these are all really great questions. Um, any questions that kind of popped up or kind of follow up things that came from these guys? No, pretty good. Okay, cool. All right, cool. And we got like 15 minutes before I have to <laughs> um, but that's okay. Uh, I think that hopefully that you guys felt that was pretty good to like, you know, kind of seeing a little bit of those questions. Um, do you guys like having those questions like 
kind of us starting off that way. I know this went a little bit longer than typically does, but just gonna give me a thumbs up. You guys are kind of liking that. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, appreciate the feedback.